From VOA Learning English, this is the Education Report. Thousands of young people in Senegal attend and live at religious schools called daras. These schools accept only boys. The students are called talibé, and they study the Quran. Some daras force students to ask strangers on the street for money and food. The government. Had promised to stop this forced begging by 2015, but the organization Human Rights Watch says there has been little progress. Recently, a government study found that more than 30,000 students were begging in Dakar, the capital. The boys were reported. To be as young as four years old, they are often walking the streets shoeless and in torn old clothes. Mad Wells is a West African researcher for Human Rights Watch. He says the boys must bring back a required amount of money, sugar, and rice, or face punishment. He says teachers will often severely beat talibé who fail to meet the demand. He also says the boys usually are hungry, live in dirty, overcrowded rooms, and receive very little real education. In March 2013, eight talibé died in a fire in Dakar. Neighbors said they knew. The children could not escape from the school building in which they were living. After the fire, Senegalese officials promised to take steps against child begging, but Human Rights Watch says the government has closed only one dara for safety reasons. HRW says there are hundreds more. That violate students' rights. Senegal's Ministry of Justice says it knows of the problems and is working on new legislation. But a ministry official notes there is cultural resistance to laws restricting religion. For VOA Learning English, I'm Alex Villarreal. This is the VOA Special English Education Report. Many rural areas in the United States have no doctor. Some medical schools are trying different ways to treat the problem. One idea is to educate doctors in smaller communities and hope they stay. Dr. William Cathcart Rake heads a new program. At the University of Kansas in the Midwest, he says we need more docs. There's somewhere like a quarter of all of our physicians in Kansas are 60 years of age or older, so we need to be replacing physicians too. He says medical students from rural areas now typically study in Wichita or Kansas City. Two of the biggest cities in Kansas. They say, you know, I really have every intention of coming back to rural Kansas, but they need a soulmate. They get married. Their soulmate happens to be from a big city, and we never see them again. The program is based in Kansas' tenth largest city, Salina. Home to about 50,000 people, Salina is about a three-hour drive from Kansas City, past fields of corn, soybeans, and cattle. Student Claire Henriksen grew up in a town of about 600 people. One reason she likes the Salina program is because of the size. There are only eight students. The smallest medical school in the country. 
classes are taught by professors in Salina or on a video link from Kansas City or Wichita. Students who complete the four-year program will then do their residency training in a small community in the surrounding area. One place a resident might work is the Clay Center Clinic, where Dr. Carrie Murphy is a family physician. Dr. Murphy says this is a clinic that has currently eight doctors and four mid-level practitioners. And we cover, of course, this town, but we also have satellite clinics in two nearby towns. We just kind of operate as a, what I call, a cradle-to-grave operation. We deliver babies and go all the way up to doing nursing home care. Rural doctors generally serve older, poorer patients. Going into a specialty in a big city can mean better working hours and more money to pay off student loans. The Salina program will pay tuition for each year that students practice in a rural area in Kansas. Dr. Cathcart Rake hopes four years of medical school and two years of residency will be enough time to put down roots. In his words, it's going to be, hopefully, harder for them to break away from those roots and go to bigger cities. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. This is the VOA Special English Education Report. More than half of young black men in the United States do not finish high school. Many grow up without fathers and in neighborhoods with gangs, drugs, and violence. 60% of those who drop out of school have spent time in jail by the age of 35. Joe Marshall co-founded the Omega Boys Club in San Francisco, California, 23 years ago. Mr. Marshall tries to give boys and girls a safe refuge and a chance at a better future. Every week, he has two basic messages for his young students. Stop the violence and don't do drugs. Mr. Marshall spent 25 years as a teacher and administrator in San Francisco. He taught math in middle school and expected to see his best students go to college. But he said a lot of his former students ended up dead or in prison for selling drugs or being involved in gangs and many girls ended up getting pregnant. The Omega Boys Club serves more than 400 young people every year. Two times a week, it offers after-school classes in math, reading, family and life skills, and college preparation. In many ways, it serves as a kind of family. It provides teenagers with structure and support. Joe Marshall has a doctorate in psychology. He sees gangs and violence as a disease that needs to be dealt with as a public health problem. He tells young people to follow some new rules for living. These rules will decrease their chances of ending up dead or in prison and increase their chances of staying alive and free. The club represents the headquarters of what he calls the Alive and Free Movement. But his most effective way to spread his anti-violence message is through radio. In 1991, Joe Marshall started Street Soldiers, a weekly call-in show. It airs on popular hip-hop station KMEL in San Francisco. Marlena was one of the graduates of the Omega Boys Club. 
She is at Southern University right now, going into her third year. She talked about what she had learned by coming to Omega. The club provides guidance and financial assistance to help students stay in school. Over 90% of members who were accepted into college have graduated. Twelve other American cities have copied the program. Joe Marshall has been invited to speak in Canada, Nigeria, South Africa, and Thailand. He turned 63 this year. He says he has no thoughts of retiring anytime soon. And that's the VOA Special English Education Report. From VOA Learning English, this is the Education Report. Parents in South Australia's Aboriginal areas may lose some of their financial aid if they do not send their children to school. New rules link school attendance with government assistance to people living in poverty. Warren Mundine is Prime Minister Tony Abbott's top advisor on issues concerning Aboriginal Australians or Aborigines. He disagrees with linking the aid to school attendance. Instead, he urges the government to find ways to improve attendance without punishing parents. He says he thinks strong, punitive measures should be the last plan of action. Mr. Mundine says the situation can change if tribal leaders support education. He says the government needs to work with parents and communities to make what he calls a massive cultural change. Other officials argue that the threat of stopping aid will force families to take education more seriously. In South Australia State, only 50% of children stay in school after the age of 15. In some areas, as many as 90% of Aboriginal children struggle to read and write. The state government says it has special programs for Aboriginal students. It says students work with their parents and teachers to develop a personal learning plan and re-examine it every year. Public schools also have people available who can work individually with Aboriginal students who need extra help. And there is a program that helps Aboriginal students deal with the change from middle school to high school. About 670,000 Aborigines live in Australia. The state of Western Australia also has special programs for these native peoples and other groups. For VOA Learning English, I'm Alex Villarreal. From VOA Learning English, this is the Education Report. The Kibera School for Girls in the Kibera Slum in Nairobi, Kenya, is the first school in the area to offer girls free education. It provides free tuition, uniforms, books, and meals to girls who qualify. The students are from pre-kindergarten through the fourth grade. The school gets its support from the surrounding community by providing people with much-needed services. The people of Kibera struggle to provide themselves with food, shelter, clean water, and good schools. Girls face the additional problems 
of discrimination and violence. Parents and guardians usually withdraw their daughters from school rather than their sons when money is lacking. So, the Kibera School for Girls works to help the community understand the value of education. Parents do not have to pay, but a family member must work at the school five weeks a year as a way to support a child's education. Girls are chosen based on the potential for their success as students and on financial need. Helping women make better futures is why Kennedy Odede established the school almost four years ago. He says that growing up in Kibera, he hated seeing that more boys than girls went to school. In 2004, Mr. Odede started a community movement that later became the organization called Shining Hope for Communities. He wanted to make life better for girls as well as boys in poor neighborhoods. Mr. Odede says he wanted everyone in the community to feel improvement in their lives. Today, the school provides services for everyone in the area, not just students. For VOA Learning English, I'm Alex Villarreal. From VOA Learning English, this is the Education Report in Special English. Today, schools in the United States communicate with parents in many different ways. Mail is still used, but now Schools and parents connect through email, Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, and Skype. The Houston Independent School District in Texas has more than 200,000 students. Most of them come from lower income families. The newspaper Education Week recently reported on a digital literacy training program that the district has started for parents. Microsoft helped the school district establish computer training centers for parents at five of its campuses. Other schools around the country are also increasing their digital services and not just in English. Many schools provide information in Spanish and other languages. Free online translation sites can also help parents stay informed about their children's education. Some school systems even give parents online access to their children's grades and schoolwork. 600 students attend Knapp Elementary School near Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Joe Mazza is head of the school. He says nearly one in five of his students come from Bangladesh and 12% come from South Korea. Joe Mazza says the most important way that a school gets to know parents is in face-to-face -face meetings. But under his guidance, the school has added social networking tools to meet the needs of the community. The school uses resources like Twitter, e-newsletters, and Skype. Teachers can talk to parents over Skype if the parents cannot attend a conference in person. Social media, Joe Mazza says, is providing us with many new and really free ways to connect with parents. For VOA Learning English, I'm Laurel Bowman. 
This is the VOA Special English Education Report. A program in the United States brings scientists and engineers into elementary schools to teach teachers more about how to teach science. Dave Weiss is a retired engineer. One day each week, he volunteers at Georgian Forest Elementary School in Silver Spring, Maryland, near Washington. He works with teacher Fred Tanik on science projects for 10-year-olds. He says, Fred is so enthusiastic and he's so much fun with the kids. I can see that he really loves what he's doing. I get as much pleasure from helping the teachers as I do helping the students. Student Jada Lockwood says she enjoys Mr. Weiss's visits to her classroom. She likes the drawings he uses to explain scientific ideas. The American Association for the Advancement of Science sponsors the Senior Scientists and Engineers program. Dave Weiss has been a volunteer in that program for many years. The scientists and engineers help teachers in elementary schools improve their skills. Mr. Weiss says he and the other volunteers help teachers by providing hands-on expertise. He notes that science is an area in which many elementary school teachers have limited experience. In elementary school, for the most part, your regular classroom teacher is responsible for teaching science, along with reading and math. And if they don't have a strong science background, just by nature, they're going to tend to underrepresent science in the curriculum. Fred Tanik agrees. He just started teaching science classes a few months ago. He says, a lot of times, I'll spit out information I learned in the book or things that are part of the curriculum. Dave helps me learn how to supplement that information so that it's more relevant to them, so that it will be more relevant to their work experience later on in life. 15-year-olds in the United States scored about average in science among countries that took part in testing by the OECD in 2009. The OECD is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. But Dave Weiss says he is hopeful for the future. He says he tries to give elementary school students a solid foundation. His hope is that they'll develop a curiosity about what's going on around them. For VOA Special English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti. We have more programs at voaspecialenglish.com where people can read, listen, and learn English with texts, MP3s, and activities. We also offer English lessons at the VOA Learning English page on Facebook. This is the VOA Special English Education Report. More than 40 of the 50 American states have approved what are known as the Common Core State Standards. These are lists of content that students are supposed to learn at each grade level from kindergarten to high school. State governors and schools chiefs led the effort to develop the standards. The project involved teachers, administrators, experts, and public comments. The final standards were released in June of 2010. Acceptance is voluntary, but acceptance helped states that entered President Obama's $4 billion race to the top competition for school reform. The standards 
are for English language arts and math. Supporters say these provide clear goals to prepare students to succeed in college and in jobs. But critics of national standards say the idea goes against one of America's oldest traditions, local control of education. Political conservatives generally oppose federal intervention in schools. Yet it was a Republican president, George W. Bush, who expanded testing requirements to show that public schools are making yearly progress. Still, opponents of national standards call them one size fits all. They say the idea does not make sense for a country as large and diverse as the United States. One of those opponents is Bill Evers at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University in California. He was an assistant education secretary under President Bush. Mr. Evers warns about closing the door on innovation by locking in a national uniform bureaucratic system. He says the states don't have a problem in setting their curriculum. They've been doing it ever since there have been public schools. Richard Riley was education secretary to President Bill Clinton, a Democrat. Mr. Riley says conservatives would be concerned if we had federal mandated common core standards. That's not what we have. It's a state driven measure. High standards, challenging work for young people across the country. Mr. Riley says in the 1990s, he pushed states to develop their own statewide standards. But some of those standards were not very strong, he says, so he believes national standards are needed. But Bill Evers says technology now makes it easier to develop individual learning plans for students. He says schools should worry less about a common curriculum and more about improving teacher quality. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. You can find a link to the Common Core Standards at voaspecialenglish.com. I'm Alex Villarreal with the VOA Special English Education Report. Last week, we talked about the conflict between sleepy teenagers and early morning classes. Many people commented on our website and Facebook page. For example, Damla Ece in Turkey wrote, I agree with the idea of starting lessons later so teenagers can feel better in the morning. But sleeping more than seven hours can be wasting time for students. Tron in Vietnam disagreed. I think teenagers, on the average, need eight to ten hours of sleep every day. It's useless trying to force them to concentrate while they can't concentrate. Enilton Nemakes in Brazil goes to sleep late and wakes up in the afternoon and wrote, That's my life, but at least I am studying. Afshin Heydari from Tehran says schools should start early to avoid heavy traffic later in the morning. And Susie from Jordan wrote, When I was a teenager, I enjoyed taking my courses as early as possible. That way, I could find a long time in the day to do my own activities. But Azra from Kyrgyzstan said the reason schools start early there is a lack of classrooms. Omid in Afghanistan calls teenagers the destiny makers of a society. So they must be more alert and active 
in order to be more successful. And Joruji in Japan wrote, When I was a teenager, I used to get up before six to go to school, which was far from home, and I don't remember having problems. I think nowadays, the internet, TV, games, and cell phones make teens go to sleep later. 30-year-old Kika in Spain says, In my opinion, young people are very lazy. But Dennis Jin disagrees. He says for high school students in China, we must reach class at 6.20 in the morning and be back home usually at 10 in the evening. Then we'll have some extra schoolwork to do. Teenagers are not the only ones who suffer. Kathy in Canada wrote, My daughter likes complaining about everything in the morning and I know that this is from lack of sleep. I wish schools should change their start time to 8.30 or 9 a.m. Vidara Mom, a Cambodian living in New Zealand, says school starts at 9 and finishes at 3 p.m. Therefore, the students have heaps of time to interact and play before they go home. Weeby Sebastian from Indonesia wishes school started at 7.30 instead of 7, but tells students don't forget to eat breakfast. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. From VOA Learning English, this is the Education Report. Teachers and parents usually call attention to the pictures when they read storybooks to preschool children. But a study published in 2011 suggests that calling attention to the words and letters on the page may help a child's reading. The two-year study compared children who were read to this way in class with children who were not. The children whose teachers most often discussed the print showed clearly higher skills in reading, spelling, and understanding. These results were found one year and even two years later. Shane Piasta at Ohio State University was an author of the study. She said most preschool teachers would find this method manageable and would need only a small change in the way they teach. They already read storybooks in class. The only difference would be increased attention to the printed text. If you get children to pay attention to letters and words, it makes sense they would do better at word recognition and spelling. But research suggests that very few parents and teachers do this in a systematic way. The report appeared in the journal Child Development. More than 300 children ages 4 and 5 were observed for the study. The children came from poor families and were below average in their language skills. There are different ways that adults can talk to children about print. They can point to a letter and discuss it and even trace the shape with a finger. They can point out a word. They can discuss the meaning of the print or how the words tell the story and they can talk about the organization of the print. For instance, showing how words are written left to right in English. For VOA Learning English, I'm Alex Villarreal. From VOA 
Learning English. This is the education report. It was not just another day in a classroom recently for some young people in Washington D.C. These student volunteers visited the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History to test a new program. Some students. Explored the mysteries of human bones. Other students examined an insect under a microscope. The student volunteers were among the first to help test a new exhibit, a new showing, at the museum. The program has an unusual name, spoken as curious. And written as Q question mark R I U S. The exhibits are designed so young people can learn about science by taking part in experiments. The program combines the newest technologies and scientific equipment with more than six thousand museum objects, both real and digital. Students from local schools help develop the exhibit, which combines science and art. Teachers will bring their science students to the exhibit in the mornings. In the afternoons, the exhibits will be open to everyone. Many of the students already have their favorite activities at the center. Thirteen-year-old Nate said he liked exploring the containers with dinosaur bones. Addie is twelve years old. She liked the bee display. She found that the bumblebee and the yellow bumblebee were very different when she examined them under a microscope. Another student. Ben said he enjoyed an exhibit that lets people use their senses to learn. He said, for example, that a butterfly smells a little like tea. Involving the senses, smell, touch, hearing, is one of the exhibit's major goals. Curious can also be found online. For VOA Learning English, I'm Laurel Bowman. This is the VOA Special English Education Report. Last week, we told you that the number of foreign students in the United States had reached an all-time high. More than 671,000 foreign students attended an American college or university during the last school year. So says the latest report from the Institute of International Education. Many international students choose large schools, but a growing number of them are attending smaller ones. Douglas Bennett is the president of Earlham College, a liberal arts college in Richmond, Indiana, that actively seeks foreign students. He says Earlham is a small college, just 1,200 students, but about 15 percent of the undergraduates come from homes outside the United States. This is very high for an American college or university. Doug Bennett has written several articles aimed at helping students choose a college that best fits their needs. He says one of the important things to consider is the size of a school. He says Earlham College is small for a reason. He says, "We're that small because we think we educate much more effectively 
and much more powerfully. Of course, there are also good arguments for attending a larger school. Many big schools are widely recognized, and in some cases that might lead to more job interviews than a degree from a lesser known college. Larger schools also have more money. This can mean more resources for education, recreation, and research. In addition to size, Douglas Bennett says there are other important things to consider. For example, which programs at the school are the strongest? Some schools have stronger programs in the sciences. Others are stronger in the liberal arts. Also, what do the school's top students do after they graduate? What kinds of activities are offered that might add to the educational experience? Are there sports teams? Something else to consider is the kinds of services that a school offers for international students. But Earlham College President Douglas Bennett says one choice tops all others. He says the most important choice you make in going to college is who you choose to be yourself. If you're prepared to bring your best self to college, then it hardly matters where you go to college. And that's the VOA Special English Education Report. From VOA Learning English, this is the Education Report in Special English. Speaking Kurdish was a crime in Turkey until about 20 years ago. More recently, the government has eased some of its restrictions on the use of the language. Now, the government is letting some schools offer Kurdish language classes. Halil Chechen teaches beginning Kurdish to medical students at Dijala University in southeastern Turkey. He says people are happy about the changes that are now being put into place. But he says people have been waiting a long time, 50 or 60 years. One student says he welcomes the classes. He speaks only a little Kurdish, he says, and he sees the classes as a big step, but they are only the beginning. He thinks learning Kurdish should be required, especially in health education. He says it would be even more successful if Kurdish were taught starting at a young age. The university is in the mostly Kurdish city of Diyarbakir. It is not far from the border with Syria. Syrian Kurds seized control of their region from Syrian government forces earlier this year. Now children are learning Kurdish as a first language. Kurds in neighboring Iraq have had that right for years. But Turkish Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan recently rejected calls for Kurdish education in the mother tongue. He called it a terrorist demand of the Kurdish rebel group known as the PKK. The Prime Minister says there is no such thing as education in the mother tongue. He says the country's official language is Turkish. Kurdish politicians face increasing pressure if they violate language restrictions. But the Kurdish language and culture are increasingly making their presence felt. For VOA Learning English, I'm Alex Villarreal. 
This is the VOA Special English Education Report. Some schools in the United States and other countries offer Chinese language classes with government support from China. St. Mary's School is a private college preparatory school in Medford, Oregon, in the Pacific Northwest. Carly Irvine is in her fourth year of learning Mandarin. She says, Since China and America are working so closely and our relationship is growing more and more, I think it will be very important in the future to know Chinese. St. Mary's also teaches Spanish, German, and Latin. It added Mandarin in 2005. Two years ago, it became the first school in the country to join the Confucius Classroom Program. The program pays about half the cost of a teacher sent to the school in the United States. China's Education Ministry also provides books and other materials. St. Mary's principal, Frank Phillips, says knowing Chinese will help students in a world where China is quickly gaining economic power. But he admits to concerns in his local community. He says, the question I always get is, is this a gigantic propaganda move? Is this an evil communist plot on the part of China? From what I can detect, having been involved in it for two years, I see none of that. In fact, the program has won the support of his local representative in the state legislature. Dennis Richardson says he has concerns about human rights in China. But he is among several lawmakers who have been pushing for more Chinese language education in public schools in Oregon. Young Ling, a teacher at St. Mary's, came from China in 2008. She says, People do not know much about China, especially the latest development. So I think this is a chance for them to know more about China, what China is really like. It's quite different from what it was 20 years ago. The Confucius Classroom Program is in about 40 countries including more than 50 American schools and universities. A recent report said more schools in the United States are teaching Chinese and Arabic, although the numbers are still low. But it said foreign language teaching in public elementary and middle schools dropped sharply in recent years. Some schools say a federal law that only measures progress in math and reading has hurt language teaching. And that's the VOA Special English Education Report. From VOA Learning English, this is the Education Report. South Africa has 11 official languages. If you want to say hello, it's Saubona in Zulu and Hello in Afrikaans. Now, South African school children may start using Ni Hao to say hello. The country's education ministry hopes to add Mandarin language classes in some schools. Mandarin is the official spoken language of China. That country is a major trading power for South Africa. The two countries recently signed an agreement that identifies five areas of cooperation. They include curriculum development, 
mathematics and science, teacher training and research and development in basic education. South African officials have not said how much the Mandarin language classes will cost. Troy Martens works for the Ministry of Basic Education. She says the new partnership is extremely valuable to both sides. The part of the plan that has gained the most attention is a proposal to offer Mandarin classes in schools. Last year, a public opinion survey showed that South Africans have mixed feelings about China. It found that 46% of South Africans do not like the spread of Chinese ideas and customs in their country. And 60% of South Africans said they dislike Chinese music, movies, and television. But Ms. Martens says trade with China is more important than those feelings. She says it is extremely helpful for South African students to learn about the Mandarin language and Chinese culture. And, she said, not every school will offer the language training. South African census officials have not said how many native Chinese speakers there are in the country. For VOA Learning English, I'm Alex Villarreal.